You know what? You know what's interesting um, is that you know prior to me discovering stoicism and CBT, that was my journey, right? It was like AA was all encompassing, and you had everybody in those rooms go, "No, this is the only thing you need." It's like you come in, you put your two dollars in a basket. That's your counseling. I'm like, mm, I don't think it works like. That. I don't think it works like that. <laughs> um, but what was interesting for me is the role of philosophy in my life and how that led me into cognitive behavioral therapy because of stoicism, which is the philosophy that I love. I study it. I love it. Um, I study the stoics. I, I, and CBT is literally the root of CBT is, is stoicism, right? It, it just is. It's, it's um, one of those really weird experiences I've had where I'm like, my God, I, I love the quotes. It's like life has become a quote or a cliche because, and everything kind of originates from being able to control yourself, right? Being able to make that next right decision. And we've seen a real demolishing of agency on behalf of people in regards to disinformation and misinformation, where they give their agency away to other people, right? They give their agency away to podunk treatments. They give their agency away to influencers. And I've watched people in your space Right. And I'm going to bring up a name. You don't have to comment on it. And I'm going to I'm not going to play this emotionally. I'm just not a fan of Jordan Peterson. But in your profession, as someone who takes evidence based science, not doing any more harm with their words, according to your professional standards and watching you fight as you fought for the past, I don't know how many years, five years. And then you've got a guy that has the same credentials in Jordan Peterson who's saying completely the other thing, talking about a fight between heaven and hell, talking about, um, you know, gender fluidity being a butcher's game, talking about um, all kinds of bullshit that he's not supposed to talk about, but he can't help himself. And the damage that that man has done, in my estimation, to young men over the past several years with negativity, victim blaming, meaning it's everybody else's fault, passing responsibility. He does the opposite of what he was taught to do according to his profession in my estimate. And you do all the things you were taught to do because you hold yourselves to ethics and professional standards. How dangerous, you know, from your professional lens, are people like that in this ecosystem? I'm going to come back to Jordan in a second because I think you're going to find it super interesting. But what, what, what I want to go to first, though, is because you mentioned kind of a parallel between CBT uh, and kind of navigating the, the disinformation space. And I think that's mm. huge because stoicism and CBT, the, the philosophy of it is really about becoming, trying to tune into our own personal biases. In CBT language, it's called cognitive distortions. We all have distortions. It filters the way that we see the world. Those distortions are often filtered by um, things like depression and anxiety. They, they kind of filter the way that we see the world. And so in CBT, we're trying to take off those biased lenses and see a more kind of complete, realistic, balanced picture of reality. And that's what's therapeutic. And from I an think, accountable perspective, right? Yeah, right. and from yeah, accountable, yeah. It, 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 it's supposed to engender agency. And I think a parallel process is happening there, too, with what we try to do as science communicators is we're, again, all, all of our brains are kind of wired for shortcuts and heuristics, and we're all biased. And so the, the CBT approach or the science communication approach, so to speak, is to become more analytical and to pause, look at accuracy, don't go on gut instincts, and to kind of step back and analyze the, the information space. And so that's a helpful thing for kind of combating misinformation and disinformation. It, it, it derives from the work of Daniel Kahneman, who won, who won a Nobel Prize uh, in economics. He, he distinguished between these two thinking styles that we have, this intuitive um, thinking style, which is very effortless and quick and gut instinct, and then this more analytical, deliberated, effortful part of our thinking Feeling versus thinking brain, yeah. Feeling exactly. versus thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Research shows when people rely on that intuitive system, back to that profile, they're more likely to fall for misinformation. So CBT, in a sense, like we're almost CBTing the world of misinformation, and that can be a helpful thing. Mm. Um, back to Jordan, you'll find this interesting. You may or may not know. So he, 
I grew up in the, in the Toronto area, as I mentioned, and I went to the University of Toronto. He was my undergraduate supervisor in the University Jesus. of Toronto. How was yeah. he? Was he? Can, can I ask you a couple? <laughs> was he? Was he like? Was he like this then? Dean, I, I want to be honest. So this was I was in my early twenties. I was yeah. a young guy then, and I didn't. I wasn't a quote unquote expert then. I didn't know anything about psychology. Here I am, a, a young man uh, in Toronto, taking these new psychology classes. And I'll be honest, I was enthralled. He's a very charismatic guy. He, this is before he blew up, right? This is this is over a decade. Yeah, he's a brown bag yeah. professor, right? He's just yeah. a dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he taught at Harvard. He went to McGill University, which is a, an amazing university with an amazing clinical psychology program. He he worked under Robert Peel, who had, who was a great researcher in and of itself. Uh, in and of himself. He had a great research track record. I volunteered in his lab and he was publishing in great personality journals. Uh, he had an H index of over 50, which is um, it's a, just a metric for how you evaluate academic performance. And his was really great. And so he kind of knew, um, he knew the confines of psychology. He knew what he was doing in that kind of area. And so I was very, like I said, enthralled and, and very biased. We're all kind of biased. And so um, I, I've defended him publicly kind of be years ago um, through all of that. And then at some point, my it, it became too much. It, there was a lot of just anti-trans rhetoric that I saw. There was a lot of anti-vaccine rhetoric. There was fat shaming women, uh, you know, like kind of plus size models. He's uh, fucking mean. He got on, mean. Yeah, on Sports Illustrated. And at some point... Like I said, we're all susceptible to to biases. And then there was just enough of that kind of rhetoric that kind of broke me free from my shackles, so to speak. And I and I, I regret supporting him publicly in the past because I think that what he's doing now is harmful. And, I, you know, that's just my personal opinion. So uh, I find it very sad because, you know, I, I did um, – I had a connection. You know, I had a personal connection with him when I was um, – an undergraduate student again in my early 20s and so oh, I just find it, yeah, yeah. I, I find it sad because I think that's happened to a lot of kind of people too where they kind of they started out kind of knowing their stuff and then they just drifted I think beyond their scope and for whatever reason just became um they kind of went in, the, in an opposite direction uh, there's other names which I won't mention but you kind of see similar things where people started out very well and then they became leaders in the anti-vaccine movement it's like how the hell did this guy was that an opportunity a, a choice of opportunity in your mind for a guy like Jordan, or does he really believe that he's not subject to the same, you know, professional standards everybody else is? He that you can eat a steak and cure a herniated back, like the, like all the crazy, you know, hellfire and brimstone bullshit. Is that is that an op? In your opinion, is that an opportunity for him, or is that you know? Is there a psychological diagnosis? You look at a guy like that and you go, hmm, it might be a number of these five things. I, I, honestly, Dean, I don't know. I, I haven't talked to him in years and I, and I can't, I can't comment on his motivations for it. I, I, I would just say that I don't, I don't like the recent rhetoric and I think it's, it's harmful. Like I said, sort of the yeah. anti-vaccine stuff, anti-trans stuff. And, and again, the fat shaming women, it just makes me sad. Yeah, it, it's it's not something, you know, and my understanding is that when you become a psychologist or a psychiatrist, your job is to not do any more mental harm, and that is mental harm on a nuclear level with five and a half million followers on social media and another five and a half million people that subscribe to your YouTube channel. It just, you know, it, it makes sense to me from a professional ethics standard standpoint, but, um, you know, it kind of leaps into the other stuff, which is, you know, the damage that influencers like him, Andrew Tate, Alex Jones, who sells more fake brain powder than any guy on the planet, like to the tune of two to three hundred million dollars a year. Um, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. I mean, take me through. Take me through your thoughts on because, you know, Pavel Durov, Telegram, he got arrested the other day conducting criminality behind the idea that that, hey, free speech is free speech. I'm not going to give you any data. But th that being said, the influencers that do peddle lies disinformation where it comes to a mental and emotional awareness like how have you seen were you prepared for this as a psychologist psychiatrist someone you know who's just kind of leapt into the last four years with everybody else or did this broadside you like everybody else and how dangerous is it yeah 
hell no. I had no idea this was coming. Like when I was a graduate student and kind of during my training, working in hospital settings and kind of helping people, it's really just the last five years um, that we went online and just saw this proliferation of misinformation just it exploded the, and the, some the, of it's so unbelievable that like you don't need to have a medical degree to go that's bullshit yeah it's it, it, yeah it, it, yeah we're not even talking about the you know we're not talking about those gray zone cases like aa cannabis psilocybin where you know though there's good research that's going to be done there we're talking about things like andrew tate saying depression isn't real or elon musk saying things like antidepressants do more harm than good or people saying that COVID-19 was a hoax or that the anti or that COVID-19 vaccines are killing people uh, more killing more people than they help like these are just they're conspiracy laden claims that are just so obviously wrong that uh, and it's dangerous when like you said influencers are tweeting and posting to a platform that reaches hundreds and millions of people um it's very dangerous I, I mentioned this before but it capitalizes on a psychological phenomenon that we call the illusory truth effect which again kind of derives from daniel common's work which is just the idea that our brains aren't good at differentiating familiarity with the truth meaning that if we see enough misinformation repeated over and over and over our brains are wired to believe that Sure. And that's not good. We need to override that kind of instinct. And that can be hard for people that don't that don't know. So it's it's incredibly dangerous when this stuff is being spouted over and over. I mentioned that in the realm in my own realm of mental health, you know, I, I was fortunate to be part of a study that I wrote in my book where we analyzed the top 1,000 videos with the hashtag mental health on TikTok. And uh, we found that when we analyze these videos where people are giving advice and information um, about mental health, we found that about one third, three, 33% of those videos are misleading, but we can see the reach of these videos and they were viewed over a billion times. So over a billion times, people are seeing misleading videos. And so again, that, that worries me with respect to this illusory truth effect, because there's just, there's so much misinformation that is baked into our, our culture now. How much um, have you seen, you know, and I won't keep you for much longer. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I want to talk about the effect this has had on you to end. And I also want to talk about what you're seeing, you know, in, in clinic, what you're seeing in therapy, what you're seeing from people. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I do a little bit of coaching on the side. I coach guys when it comes to alcohol abuse, when it comes to response therapy and in no way, you know, and it, this is just people that have come to me in the past and me upskilling in my own life, which I won't get into because it pales in comparison to your resume. But you know, the, I, I see a noted difference in people in confusion, what they understand to be true, how they cope with it, with drugs and alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to get to that. But more importantly, how are you doing? Because, you know, you and I share the same stalkers and people that deliver death threats, right? And, and it takes a toll. Like, I just finished taking three months off uh, because I was burnt out. I needed to organize my thoughts. I needed to get some treatment. I needed to understand myself. I needed to decide what was next in my life, and this is it. Uh, doing the right things for the right reasons, trying to help people understand things, having an open mind, but being responsible and accountable, being fun when we do it. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, this manifested itself in, and I've seen it in you, and you've been honest about, you know, the effect that this has had on you, because psychologists and psychiatrists aren't just bulletproof because they're psychologists and psychiatrists. So how has this manifested itself in in your life, you continually trying to do the right thing and the beat down that we both have experienced and continue to experience when it comes to just trying to help people understand shit. Totally. I, and, and at this point, since Elon Musk took over X, I, you know, for the past Is it year, way worse? Or so, yeah. way worse. I literally get at least 100 abusive messages a day. Literally, I'm not exaggerating that number across my, my platforms. And so, yeah, I mean, initially, I've been qualify I've been, abusive for me or quantify it. Uh, death threats, uh, cyber stalking, um, people taking my photos and you know manipulating them and and saying like just personal attacks, attacking credentials, attacking character. Um, this one too. I'm gonna bring this one up. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, some, that's, a, that's a funny one. Though. Some <laughs> guy with triumph anniversary. Your new book comes in. Mind the science. You're like, hey, my new book's coming out. <laughs> 
three years, three years in the making, and he's covered by some testicles. Uh, so, <laughs> get points for creativity, so, though. Yeah. So there's that, and then there's option. You know, there's been fake. There's been uh, fake complaints to my university, fake complaints to my regulatory bodies. So this stuff, you know, it, it they're meant to harm. It's meant to having. It's meant to have a chilling effect and to silence people. And it's chased a lot of really good people off. Uh, off social media, like uh, Peter Hotez, who's back now, but he's a champion in public health. So people, yeah, you guys, really... you guys had a mutual tweet admiration thing this morning. I thought that was really nice. Yeah, yeah thank you. G- guys were showing up at his house, and Elon Musk was attacking him and RFK Jr. So, like, you know, he gets it probably the worst I've ever seen anyone have harassment. Um, but yeah, you know how I cope with it. Um, like you said, we're you know we're all human. I I am blessed and kind of fortunate in the sense that you know I, I do happen to have an arsenal of coping skills. So I'm able to emotionally regulate. I'm able to tolerate it. I've also been well practiced at dealing with the shit, so to speak, for about mm-hmm. five years. So you know it's part of the process for me now. And I I like to help other people who are kind of going through it and try to help them depersonalize or not taking it personally because you know the person who put testicles on my photo there you know he doesn't know who i am he's he's attacking a cartoonish version of who he thinks i am or an idea of who he thinks i represent and so i i'm, I'm very good at kind of you know using humor to kind of laugh this stuff off because I, I don't take it personally i don't let it penetrate my self-esteem so to speak but that's had to take practice and you know, I, I, it takes it takes active work at using coping skills and not everyone has that ability and I, and I feel for them and it sucks. And so I do like to call it out when I see it and I, I like to um, make it a point to draw attention that science communicators in general do get this kind of harassment in health professionals and others. And so I don't think it's acceptable, but I think it's an important area that people need, I guess, more training just to tolerate it and manage it because it's a, it's a, you know, you and I are by no means the only ones. This is happening um, across the world for people that do it. There was a, a, a survey in one of the top medical journals in nature and it surveyed, there was tons of uh, health professionals and scientists that are receiving death threats and abuse like that. So um, yeah, that's how I'm coping. I, I personally like to use a, a tad of humor to try to spin it in a way that also kind of that helps to debunk misinformation. But that's my own unique style, and that's not for everyone. And I get that how I get how it's not for everyone because it can be very discombobulating for people. Oh yeah, totally. I, you know, and I've had to change my tack because, as you know, I can go for the throat, and I'm a big fan of going for the throat. My theory is. Why well, fuck around in the middle when I can go right to the end? And so that's generally what I do. But, you know, there's a higher purpose and responsibility. I find as a human being trying to, you know, contribute discourse. Marcus really has said it best. You know, fruit of this life is being of good character and acts for the common good. And if we're going to continually cut people's legs off, um, you know, and there's a difference between bots and, and abuse and someone just asking a question, right? And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's very, very different. But um, I always like to ask guys like you how you deal with stress when it comes to this kind of stuff, because this kind of stuff sends a lot of people to the hospital, right? Like, I mean, it's just continually being inundated with negativity, threats, and and at some point, your inner self or that imposter that sometimes lives in all of us is like, you can start asking those questions of yourself if enough of it comes in, right? Where you're like, am I really a quack or am I really a third rate hack journalist? Am I, am I really these things other people say? But to your point, and again, I go back to this, and this is the beauty of philosophy and CBT is one of the great quotes of all time, which is uh, something that was driven into my head by one of my mentors, Donald J. Robertson, who wrote a book called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor is a quote by Epictetus. And it's like, you wouldn't give, uh, if someone tried to give your body to a passerby, you'd be furious, but you willingly give your minds to those people. You know, you willingly hand over your wellness, your, your agency, your mental and emotional agency to people through resentment and anger. And if you ask me, and I want your opinion on this, the biggest mental health issue that we see every day is that specifically from this community, it's, we are out of control you know there's a political answer someone's going to come along and fix our problems you know there's a there's a a dirt pill or a poop pill answer it's someone's promising that they can do this for us and i am so desperate and i am so depressed and i've experienced so much trauma as an individual that i'll give all that agency over to people and you can't control yourself in those capacities because you've given your minds to somebody else do you see that a lot in the people that come in their confusion is derived from them giving their mental and emotional agency away 
I, I, yeah, I think in part, I think there's so many factors at play. I think that is huge. I think people are just, again, bombarded by misinformation. I think I think people, so I mentioned those in, that individual profile. So there's personality traits that leave people susceptible to misinformation. There's also the social level um, that, I, that I wanted to mention as well. So we're preyed upon by bad actors, so to speak. Mm. I mean, RFK Jr. has got his children's health defense, which is literally targeting people with misinformation about the nature of you know anti-vaccine stuff wellness influencers are doing that so there's actual bad actors the algorithms of social media itself is is is, is biased against us so it's mm-hmm. looking for emotion-laden oversimplified headlines that again just are devoid of any nuance or any gray or any discussion and so people come to therapy sessions just confused um, I'll have people come who think you know they're anti big pharma or they, they're scared of taking psychiatric medications or they don't know if mental illness is real or not because they've read it online and so you know it's it, it hurts me as a clinician to see that crap already adding to the burden of their mental health concerns mm. Mm, yeah, well, that's because you're a good doctor. That's why. That's because you you are a responsible individual who gives a shit about uh, the human experience and the human being. Um, and and dude, let me say this: really glad you finally took me up on the offer. I have really enjoyed spending an hour chopping it up with you, trying to uh, get to the bottom of you know a professional's opinion on misinformation, disinformation. By the way, those are two different things, right? Disinformation is intentional misinformation. Yeah, it's one of those studies that's wrapped up in like a, a cool looking peer reviewed journal. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that you can identify what the truth is from a lie when it comes to your wellness and your medical um, well being. And Dr. Jonathan Stea is one of those bright lights in the dark sky. I would highly encourage everybody to go get his book. September the third is when it drops. You can order it anywhere, including Amazon, jonathanstea.com, no H in Jonathan. Well, there is after the T, but not after the O. Um, <clears throat> he's uh, tired of mental health information, pseudoscience, pervades healthcare, pop culture, social media, the wellness industry. He wrote a book about it, Mind the Science, when it comes to your mental health, coming September the tw- th- uh, sorry, 3rd, 2024. Uh, and dude, a pleasure to talk to a fellow Calgarian. I miss the West. Not right now, but I do miss the West. I miss the geography and the people. Maybe one of the most beautiful uh, places in the world for me is, is, is Calgary. And as a University of Calgary alum, nice to see you. Go Dinos. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Dean. My pleasure. Talk to you soon.